in. And you are going to see it. My goodness. I can't believe it. Unbelievable. On November 9, 1996, the World Heavyweight Champion Mike Tyson defended his WBA title against Evander Holyfield. The fight was supposed to take place back in June 1990, but four months before that, Mike sensationally lost the fight against James Douglas. As soon as the fight was announced, Tyson was a 25-to-1 favorite. The closest to the fight became 6-to-1, but Tyson was still a big favorite. Of his last four fights, Evander lost two, one by knockout, and many believed his career is close to over. In the 90s, Tyson was no longer as formidable as in the 80s. However, he still had enough strength to be a serious threat in the heavyweight division. At that time, the fight set a sales record, pay-per-view 1.6 million. The boxers' fees were huge. Hollyfeld received $12 million, Tyson, 30. It might be something different. And he's also trying to catch him coming in. That's that's the game plan, but he's getting hit off. As soon as he hit him, he got him. When the bell rang and Tyson landed a right hand that sent Hollyfeld skittering across the ring, it looked like the fight might be over in the opening minute. But then a strange sight presented itself. Tyson's appointed victim did not cave in and crumble, and in fact, did not appear to be the least bit intimidated. In round two, Hollyfield forced him to the ropes and hit him with flush shots, including a powerful left that snapped Mike's head back. has put together a string in the past three rounds that's just been incredible, and Mike is slowing, Mike may be hitter. Holyfield comes back, and this is a surprise that drew a roar because he's working on Tyson. Watch the time. Honeymoon in November 8th. Seconds of round number three. As Holyfield looks to counterpunch off the swinging miss. Does Evander Holyfield start to wear out as he does in all fights? If that's the case, that may It was actually a one-sided fight, with Tyson winning few exchanges. The only round that clearly belonged to him was the fifth, when he finally landed some clean blows, including his trademark left hook uppercut combination, which momentarily discouraged the challenger. In the sixth, Tyson sustained a cut and was stunned by a right hand, then suffered a knockdown. punches here by Mike Tyson. Left uppercut that sent Holyfield backpedaling. Evander's zeroing in on a big shot. Tyson is confused, frustrated. He unleashed a flurry there, but Holyfield comes right back and counters to the head. With his right hand, there you see him again trying to rock and roll. Mike's got to throw to second and third punch in combat. Evander Holyfield is letting it all hang out. Coming, but I have him ahead by so much. I have Vendor ahead by so much that it's getting to the point where he, either he gets a knockout or he's going to win this fight. He may look tired, but Tyson doesn't look like a ball of energy either. But also remember the heart. He can't fight inside with Mike. I don't think anybody can. Holyfield kicking to the body with a right uppercut. Let go. I vice grip. And unleashing right uppercuts in the process. Well, to get, let him have some in the round. Good combination, fast, out him. But back comes Tyson with a hard punch. And left hook to the chin, I'll tell you what. That got Evander's attention, and good. Tyson, unleashing uppercuts to the body, digging to the chin. Started turning on, and I think he, he senses it. So he's fighting a little bit happier and a little bit stronger. And you know what happened there? Well, this is what we came to see. How can he do without fighting in each round? Holyfield also doing a nice job of picking off punches. No, he's fighting a bright, bright, brilliant fight. He Mike can't throw going on. Tyson fights at such a frantic pace, and you pointed that out. Look out now. And Holyfield has always known in the past what tools to bring to a fight. And he's proving it again here. Look at this toe-to-toe -to -toe action. Well, Mike is getting to that little level where he might need a knockout. I don't know what the judges are looking at. I don't know how much they give a favorite. Uh... Tyson missing and Holyfield countering with a right uppercut. Evander is fighting the fight, but what he's doing is kind of smart. He's trying to smother Mike. Perhaps he can. Holyfield also showing more hand speed. 
it, it is not letting Tyson do any of the bullying. He's doing all of it. I think Holyfield's a lot stronger than Tyson. Big shots, hooks, and uppercuts. He, Evander Holyfield is disorganizing Tyson. He's keeping him out of his attack. Banner, as a result, in the Holyfield corner, they detected a little nick on the side of his mouth, but they said nothing to be concerned with. It hit him real low, and it hurt him. Mike's face crinkled when he got hit. He grimaced. Holyfield turned on by the crowd. Less than a minute, six rounds. And, and here is where corners. So nice and calm. Nice and calm. You have to work that body. You have to work that body. Put some heat on that jab now, okay? Put some heat on it, boss. He's getting a good rest. Unfortunately, when I fought him, I let him work by throwing punches on my head too often, and he got a little tired. Any kind of boxing and trying to land that one big shot, and that's a puncher's mistake. You lose rounds, 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 and hope to get that knockout. Connected several times in round one, but Tyson was able to duck under a number of others. In the meantime, Mike Tyson, it's a smart move. Now he's fighting a very smart fight. He's... Start it now. Quickly tying him up as he comes in. Straight left hand there by, by Tyson, but a glancing blow. Back comes Holyfield. The jab of Holyfield. The defensive move by Tyson ducks under the right hook by Holyfield. Tyson. And Evander has the reach. He should use that up that jab. The chance of Holyfield. In the tenth, the inevitable happened. Tyson had already been stung several times over the course of the battle, but with 20 seconds left in the round, Hollyfeld inflicted truly serious damage with a perfectly placed counter right to the temple, and the crowd instantly came to its feet as Tyson's legs buckled. Hollyfeld got home eight more clean punches before the bell, and as the champion walked unsteadily back to his corner, it was abundantly clear that the fight was over. A still hurting Tyson answered the bell for the 11th, but Hollyfeld quickly finished him off the referee stopping the contest with Mike defenseless on the ropes. Mike is out on his... Holyfield smothers Tyson. Looking to put Tyson down and end the fight. Tyson being chip rounds, round 11. A perfect fight. No matter what happens from here on in. I'll tell you what, the crowd thought that Mike was hurt. That's Mike got a good shot. Holyfield continues to dig in. A left hook to the head. He's got Tyson in trouble. Tyson's ready to go. Charge Mitch Halpern stops the contest. He's the winner of World Evander. The real deal. Holy fear. On May 18th, 2002, two true warriors met in the ring. A fighter from Canada, Arturo Gotti, and a fighter from the USA, Mickey Ward. In a fight, Gotti gave it his all, but outside the ring, he was just a good guy, and that's why boxing fans loved him. Mickey Ward had these same qualities, but due to bad managers, his career was not as successful as Arturo's, and he was not as popular. But in 2001, he was lucky when Lou DiBella became his promoter. He always liked Ward, and he helped him with his career. HBO was interested in this fight, and Arturo immediately agreed because he was sure that Mickey wouldn't cause him problems. There wasn't much interest in the fight, even though it was the main event of the night on HBO. In the beginning rounds, Gaddy had great success playing the role of boxer to Ward's stationary slugger. Gaddy would open up with combinations and Ward would stand still, as if his feet were nailed to the floor with his high guard, just taking the shots. This saw Ward suffer a cut around his right eye in the very opening round, as Gaddy outworked and outboxed him for the first two rounds. Before the blood really coagulates. Hard left hook by Arturo. Close and closer now. What Gaddy's people have been most concerned about is just this kind of stuff that will keep Ward in the fight long enough. Yep, and here, here, comes, right the, here comes the Lowell, Massachusetts contingent rising to the occasion for their fighter. Yeah, and here's yeah. Gaddy with some of that. I'll give it to yes. him the body medicine. Now the fighters turn out to be what we expect. Good sharp left hook upstairs by Gaddy. Uppercuts for Arturo. Fast hands. Ward's cut opening again. In round four, Ward landed a thudding right hand that rocked Gaddy's head to the side with nearly two minutes left in the round. Gaddy came back moments later with a spirited combination. 
With a little less than 30 seconds left in the round, Getty caught Ward with a hard blow that was just above the cup, dropping him to the floor. Ward punched the canvas in anger and managed to climb back to his feet as the referee deducted a point from Gaddy from the low blow. A little better, but he's been rocked in this round. Oh, big left hook by Ward. Been the right hand now, more so than the body punch. In the fifth round, the boxers exchanged tough combinations, and at the end of the round, Mickey delivered a sharp blow to the liver, but Arturo survived. Round six and seven saw Gaddy back on his bike, circling and moving, boxing well behind his jab and avoiding the pressure of Ward, who was still landing meaningful punches, but simply not enough of them. Turning all of his body weight through on every punch. And at this stage, if you don't look closer, you think that Ward is about to give. And here Ward's coming back. And I didn't think that Gaddy was expecting to throw that many players at this point in the fight. Oh, what a haymaker by Gaddy. And Ward just comes right back. Business as usual. Big left hook. Oh, it's another right hand again, and it comes right back. Round 8 saw Ward finally realize the range and urgency that had served him so well in Round 5, albeit near the very end of the frame. He was aware that he was behind on points. He stalked with more purpose and was letting his hands go. Gaddy continued to slip and move, firing off hard shots one moment and holding the next, perhaps to get a little breather. about Gaddy because right. he hasn't right. been in this kind of a war with as a strong a fighter as Ward before. That body shot again. That's the body shot. It's the left hook to the body. Ward's money punch. And this knockdown counts. Ward is going to go right back down there again. Right to the body again. He's still hurting from the body punch also still. In addition to the head. himself out for the time being. A minute and a half to go in the round. Come on. Come on. Come on, let's fight. That, that's where he needs to go to the body. You know. Round nine was probably the best in the televised history of the sport. In this round, Gaddy had landed 42 of 61 power punches for a 69% connect rate, while Ward had landed 60 of 81 for the 73% connect rate. After such an incredible round, the next and final frame passed without much incident. The judges awarded the victory to Ward by a narrow decision, but it didn't really matter whom the judges declared as a winner, the fight was so great. Gaddy got hurt with the body shot. And that that's did more damage. Now he's coming back. Mickey Ward said he would retire if he loses this fight. From the way Gaddy went back to the corner. In, in most conditions, this fight would have been stopped right here. He may have to have taken some yes, and he's taken fresh air from it. And he's winning this fight now. I am 
humbled by watching these two guys. This is the way it has to end. On October 30, 1974, the world heavyweight champion George Foreman defended his title against the former world champion Muhammad Ali. Big George became the champion by simply destroying Joe Frazier in less than six minutes, while previously it was Joe Frazier who inflicted Ali's first defeat. Three years later, Ali took revenge and went back to fight for the title. The promoter of the fight was Don King, who promised $5 million to each boxer. In the end, the fight took place in Africa, in a country that's now called the Democratic Republic of Congo. Foreman was unbeatable and had a streak of 24 consecutive knockouts. Many expected Ali to approach the fight as he had the bouts of his youth, with quick footwork and finesse. Indeed, Ali had told the press before the fight that he would attack Foreman this way. However, Ali came out with a much slower, more methodical approach. In the first round, he attacked Foreman ferociously before retreating to the ropes and allowing his opponent to throw punches and gradually tire himself out, a tactic since dubbed rope dope Ali blocked and dodged many of Foreman's strikes in the early rounds but sustained several arm and body blows. has a tremendous look of determination. Staggered! Foreman staggered! Definitely! On the rubbery side. And the referee separates the two fighters. There's the vicious left! No real serious damage done! Ali is getting his hand Eventually, Ali's strategy paid off. By the fifth round, Foreman had begun to visibly tire. Most of Foreman's shots were blocked, and when the champion did manage to land a solid blow, the Iron Tough Ali taunted him by pausing to ask like a neophile, comparing vintages, if that was George's best. In the eighth, Ali saw his chance and went on the attack, knocking Foreman out with a combination of quick punches, shocking his opponent and the world. The fight showed that Ali was capable of taking a punch and highlighted his tactical genius, changing his fighting style by adopting the rope-a-dope instead of his former style that emphasized movement to counter his opponent. 
At that time, Ali became only the second heavyweight after Floyd Patterson, who managed to regain the heavyweight championship. Oscar De La Hoya vs. Floyd Mayweather was one of the biggest fights in boxing history. It took place on May 5, 2007 at the MGM Grand in Las Vegas. Oscar was the side A and his fee was more than $50 million. Floyd received less, but also an impressive $25 million. The fight sold almost 2.5 million PPV. The total income from all sources amounted to $165 million. Floyd Mayweather chose the role of bad guy in this show and in every way possible tried to offend and insult Oscar, especially before the fight at the press conferences and interviews. Also, the intrigue was that for the last six years, Oscar's coach was Mayweather's father, who agreed to continue working, but for a larger fee. But in the end, Oscar decided to turn to Freddie Roach for help. Mayweather's coach was his uncle Roger, whom he respected more than his father. The superstar at the time was Oscar, but the two-to-one favorite was Floyd. Floyd had his trump cards like speed, boxing IQ, and defensive skills. Oscar's trump cards were size, punching power, and experience. Floyd had his first fight in 154 pounds, and it was clearly not his weight. His early speed. Now Oscar was lining up where he might go, and a quick crossover shot by Floyd. De La Hoya was the aggressor throughout the fight, and he managed to get through Mayweather's defenses in the early rounds as Mayweather moved away and counterpunched without great effect. Every time Mayweather went near the ropes, De La Hoya tried to trap him there and land a flurry of punches to the body and head. De La Hoya wanted to get Mayweather into a brawl, but he was having no part of it, content to pick his spots and land counterpunches. In the fifth round, however, the fight seemed to shift into a different gear as Mayweather stood his ground and landed some hard combinations to the head. Well, this is the round where Oscar De La Hoya... Hey, listen, I don't think Floyd can hurt him. If I'm Oscar, I'm going to load up shots. Oscar trying to line him up again. Sneaky right-hand lead, but he paid for that one. He's setting up the jab to go to the body, which he's been able to do. Yeah, good left hook that time to make it definitive. That's it, the right hand. And his fight plan is starting to work. He's backing him up. He caught him. He caught him with a shot. He needs left hook, right hand. He steps up, punishing shot. Oscar putting it on now. Don't worry about eating the jab, I say. Just take it and go right after him. Throw the right hand lead. Excellent. Yeah, he's backing off. I've never seen this before. Now, Shane also told me that he'll throw jab, jab. I saw him beginning to do that. See, jab, jab. He knows how he has to beat Floyd Mayweather. And he rounds two and three. De La Hoya, 10 for 47. Mayweather, 17 for 40. Or are you going to be the guy who's more accurate? Usually more punches wins. Mayweather just smiles at him and takes a whack at him on the inside. Then he says, come on in here. Oscar's not, not intimidated by this guy whatsoever. Now he lines up and Oscar backs up. There's the hand speed of Floyd. And the judges seeing that seven or eight punches to the body, there wasn't a heck of a lot of difference. They're too early to be predicting any of that right now. Because Floyd really hasn't opened up yet. He hasn't been offensive minded yet. Power shots 33 to 29 in, in favor of Mayweather through the four rounds. So they've been able to load up in equal measure as we get into the second third of the fight. Here, when he throws the hook, Delahoya cuts off the ring and comes back at him. There he is, pot shot and Oscar. Nice right hand. Good left hook. This is a very good round for Mayweather. Oh, he really rocked Oscar coming in. Yeah, he did. Now he tries it. Goes to the body. Back upstairs. Chopping right hand. Caught him again. Oscar doesn't have the hand speed, but he has the power. Oh, he got drilled again. Oh, yeah. That's a Mayweather round for Floyd Mayweather. Nice uppercut. 
snaps the head of Oscar. De La Hoya is attacking him. So now De La Hoya has to somehow get through without getting hit. And he sure does try to maximize. Uh, De La Hoya is saying that Mayweather has all the momentum here. That was right on top of the liver. Yeah, on the inside because Mayweather is lining up that right hand. Oscar De La Hoya got there first that time. Have to be an accumulation of punches. And Oscar does have a tendency in later rounds sometimes to wilt. But Mayweather outboxing him now. As the bell in the sixth round. Tried to win some fans over by doing that, but he didn't. Here's Oscar. Caught him with the right hand. Floyd just smiles at him. And Oscar says, you won't smile. Back of the skull. Mayweather took the first minute of the round off and let De La Hoya build a big lead in the round. Look at him smiling. He loves it. Look at him grinning. Try to steal it at the end, but this has been uh, De La Hoya's round. And, you know, maybe each guy will have to take one of these. Oscar having a good seventh round. Jab, jab. Here's Floyd right back. Kenny says keep him up. Two good body shots. Easy round for De La Hoya. Two different style fighters. The counter puncher with the speed. In his last 18 fights, he's been averaging 50 punches a round. But Mayweather lands more. Look at this. Oscar on the assault. By the time in the second half of their fight, De La Hoya started to tire. Mayweather was starting to prove himself not only the world's finest active fighter, but potentially the finest of all time. When a split decision and scores of 116 to 112, 115 to 113, and 113 to 115 in Mayweather's favors were announced, it was unjust. The first of the scores was the most accurate of the three. True to that script, if you had to give me a choice, I'd rather have the higher attempted numbers when push came to shove. I've been, a lot of them have been blocked. Oscar's trained well for this guy because he trained against the hand speed of Shane Mosley. These intangibles, they start to weigh. Well, Oscar needed just this, another one of these flurries. It seems like he gets one or two of these up every round. It's a good right-hand body shot. Again, Oscar lingering in the kill zone. See what happens? He's throwing when he enters the kill zone. He's fine because he gets to the body, and this is the flurry he needs. Watch your hands. The other element is that Mayweather's countering, and that's tough to win that way with the judges. Walsing into the kill zone without throwing, and he pays. Every time he, well, you know, he's doing a pretty good job blocking these. And see again, walked into the kill zone without throwing pay that time, but he will. And he does. His arms are slowed down considerably. Keep his legs closer together, but his legs are far apart. You see what's happening? He can't reach him when his legs are far apart. And he's tired too. That's and, then, and then you're into that split phenomenon. Yeah. Good body shot by Floyd. What I call tired mind mistakes. But cracked with the right hand. This is vintage, vintage now, Floyd Mayweather. His heels are heavy, but he still has a heavy punch. Trying to hunt him down. Makes the mistake again of entering the kill zone without throwing. And he pays again. With this, the right hand, he's found a spot for it. He's ducking De La Hoya's best shots here. He can't catch him. The reason, again, legs too far separated. Clinic against the arguably the most popular fighter, not arguably the most popular fighter in the world. MGM Grand Garden. Look at this. The battle is on. Oscar throwing his hammering him. Oscar trying to do what he can. The wide shots. The right hand now. There it goes. It caught him, but it didn't quite catch him. We'll have to look back. He hit a stamina wall. Dan Hoyer may have hit him with heavier blows. Trying to load up a shot. He's given it everything he's got by two tremendous athletes. Look at De La Hoya trying to finish strong. Will Floyd remain undefeated? How do you like it? How do you like it? How about that? And they want to still go at it. In 1995, Tommy Morrison was offered a shot at the IBC minor title against Donovan Ruddick. 
Both fighters had been ranked number one heavyweights in previous years and were looking to make a comeback after grueling losses. Morrison wanted to return to title contention after losing the WBO heavyweight title by first-round knockout to Michael Bent in October 1993. After that, he was undefeated with six wins and one draw in a row. Ruddick was a top contender before suffering a crushing second-round knockout loss to Lennox Lewis in October 1992. Following this defeat, Ruddick took a year off before returning with a unanimous decision victory in January 1994. The fight took place at Municipal Auditorium, Kansas City on June 10, 1995. Tommy Morrison's weight was 227 pounds, Ruddick was more heavy, 244 pounds. Ruddick had a great start dropping Morrison with an uppercut less than a minute into the first round, although Morrison immediately returned to continue the fight. Morrison bounced back and won the second round, stunning Ruddick with his uppercut. Both fighters continued to trade powerful punches in the third and fourth rounds, but Ruddick took control in the fifth round, hurting Morrison with several left hooks and keeping him at bay with his jab. Terrific uppercut that was. He got himself. Ruddick creates his opening here. Stepping back first to create there. And then Morrison is on the clinch. And there. No, Ruddick hadn't shown that in other fights. And, and it wasn't in a situation that Morrison had left himself open to launch into it. The hook block by Morrison. Ruddick has done a nice defensive job. Good combinations by Morrison. Razor Ruddick is not a guy that throws a lot of punches. He's very, there's the uppercut landing, but this time Morrison absorbs the punch. But he's still paid for it. Oh, he hurt Ruddick with a right uppercut. Razor Ruddick got rocked by the same punch that knocked Morrison down. Lipton, give him a standing eight count. That's bizarre. Because of the gloves on the top of the rope. Yeah. It just seemed like Morrison had a big advantage there that they took away from him. Tommy Morrison hurts Ruddick, but that counts as a knockdown would. The possibility of Morrison knocking him out. It's the only reason why I was critical there of Ron Lipton, who, by the way, is a very, very good referee. So in round two, it's Morrison's turn to hurt Ruddick. Let's take a look at that knockdown. Now Morrison starts with the uppercut. Tremendous shot. He set Ruddick up for it, then drives it back. Now watch Ruddick's glove. He holds on to the ring for support. It's a quick call. Quick call there, but when a fighter does hold on for support, a knockdown is called. Watch the gloves of Ruddick. Big shot first by Morrison. After Ruddick hits him, he comes out. He will use his leverage the way Ruddick did in round one to get things moving. Big uppercut after he'd been showing hook, driving Ruddick back. Ruddick hangs on right there. Combination by Tommy Morrison, the hands beat. Oh, big hook by Ruddick, and he lands an uppercut. Now remember against Ray Mercer. Ruddick stood up after that one. Razor Ruddick not only stood up, he took a little walk in his corner. Okay. Maybe he wanted to clear his head. Around, I now say, folks, who's going to get tired? Because both men have shown some signs right here. And they also said establish yourself down low, which is a good idea to try to get underneath Razor Ruddick and then go to the body as he does there. When he starts to the body and then comes at virtually no effective punches on the outside, but there is Anderson recently, which Morrison looked dead after the fourth round. Took some punishment. Now, a moment ago, Ruddick had Tommy Morrison right in front of him and did not fire the uppercut. Now he gets it in. Morrison not punching on the inside, Ruddick is. enough to keep Ruddick at bay, though. Shows you how slow Ruddick is moving. Ruddick cutting off the ring, sets up the run in his arsenal. Ruddick really does it. Morrison should use it. Good uppercut, but Morrison comes back with the hook. He's got Ruddick hurt. He hurt him with the left hook. Razor Ruddick is hurt now. Good body combinations by Morrison. But Ruddick is talking to him. Well, 
Morrison gets some good offense going after the Ruddick uppercut. For the second time in the fight, he timed a Ruddick uppercut and then comes in behind it. Here, Ruddick is extremely tired for the first time, really showing that. Morrison gets a nice left hook there, continuing to windmill. Ruddick with the wide open mouthpiece. Decides to voice his displeasure. Moving in boxing as he did against George Foreman. But oh my, he took a big left hook. Well, they say that was low. I don't know. Pretty potent body punches though in the last round of two. Now he is forcing Morrison back. That uppercut may have stunned Morrison. Tommy Morrison got hurt by the right hand. He couldn't bring his chair back. Ruddick is going after him. We talked about the stamina of both men. Morrison has had trouble to be quite interesting. It ain't over yet. Morrison dabbing his eye. I don't know if he's cut over his left eye. It doesn't look like it. There's the Morrison. Fighting as if neither one is confident that they will get the decision or that the fight will go all the way. But Ruddick landing some big shots here in this round. Just this with that uppercut. His hooks have been very good. Morrison has forgotten what works for him. That is go to the body and then throw a combination. He's unable to do that. Big hook by Ruddick. Big round for Razor Ruddick. Morrison with a... Ruddick takes off here in round five. Good jab from the outside. Good hook. Hurts Morrison here. In the sixth round, Tommy Morrison was stunned by the left hook and was in danger. Ruddick tried to finish the fight, but Tommy Morrison used his moment and catched him with his signature left hook. Ruddick collapsed to the canvas, but he got up and returned to the fight. Donovan tried to hold on to Tommy's arms, but Tommy freed himself and began to beat him against the ropes. The referee counted out a standing knockdown. A third knockdown would have meant a stoppage of the fight, and Tommy understood that. He was tired, but with the last of his strength, he tried to finish his opponent. And he succeeded. Several hits from the left hand forced the head of the razor to throw back and the referee intervened. It happened 10 seconds before the end of an incredible sixth round. And Ron Lipton told us before the fight, he would like to see the standing eight not in effect here. The three knockdown rules not in effect because of flash knockdowns. He may be forced to stop this, yet court fighters think they can keep going. Remember, Razor Ruddick was the stoppage of the year when he was... The fight was stopped against Mike Tyson by referee Richard Steele. Morrison is nailing him, though. He needs to buy about 10 more seconds, and it's a long one. He will not do it. Oh, my, it's over. Toward the end of the round, Ron Lipton says, I have seen enough. Tommy Morrison. You'll get a look at the We knockout. talk about Morrison's terrific left hook. And you are going to see it. My goodness. Lands all that. Ruddick hits the canvas and got up it. It started things. Now, Ruddick is coming on. He's already got Tommy Morrison hurt. The big uppercut. But if you miss, Morrison there makes him pay with the left hook. A counter left hook was a big shot. Now we get into the subjective calls here. The standing in. And Ruddick is taking quite a pounding here. Late in the round. So Ron Lipton comes in, uses it, and... A standing eight, and Ruddick is upset. He thought Lipton would stop the fight. Real heartbreak. There are only seconds remaining here, and he could not keep Tommy Morrison off. And here, he's buying time. There's about 20 seconds here. Ruddick doesn't have that much time to kill, but he doesn't tie Tommy Morrison up. So, Moore comes in here. That big left hook snapping back the head is what did it. The winner and new IBC heavyweight champion. On March 17, 1990, one of the biggest battles of the early 90s took place. A junior welterweight unification bout between two undefeated boxers, WBC champion Julio Cesar Chavez and IBF champion Medrick Taylor. This was the biggest fight at 140 pounds since the two early 1990s Aaron Pryor Alexis Oregulo fights. Chavez was the leader of the P4P rating. Taylor, who was the winner of the 1984 Olympics Games, was in fifth place. Chavez's fee was $1.4 million and Taylor received $1 million. This fight could easily be called Strength versus Speed. 
Taylor fought the first four rounds as many expected. He boxed brilliantly, landing at will against the always aggressive but easy to hit Chavez. Chavez was like a lot of Mexican fighters. They were great offensively, but their defense was not their forte. Taylor lands a vicious right hand. Combination, he did what you were talking about before. He threw three or four punches and then he got out of there. But then he can linger. That's true, Larry. That's what this is another very good round from Eldrick Taylor. They're fighting in the zone, in the middle of the ring. Chavez lands a solid right hand. But you see the frustration. Chavez still boring in, coming straight forward against Taylor. Good right hand lead by Taylor. Still trading four blows to one for Chavez. Chavez tries the left inside. Taylor comes right back. He won this fight with fine fashion. Now get out. Solid left hand. And to clarify what I said, Roger Mayweather and Sammy Fuentes ended their bouts on the stools in their corners, not flat on their backs on the canvas. Chavez simply wore them down. Beginning in round five, Taylor made a tactical decision to make the fight an inside affair. Chavez was so easy to hit that Taylor took the fight to him. Between rounds five and nine, Taylor outlanded Chavez three to one. Chavez's clubbing punches were also landing. Even though Taylor had dominated the first eight rounds of the fight, both eyes were swelling rapidly and he was swallowing a lot of blood. The body effectively. They trade punches inside and Meldrick seemed to wobble for just a second. Right hand lead. This is a, in the legs of Meldrick Taylor. Still a lot of bounce. And that gets back to the fact Chavez has not done damage to the body like he used to He hurt Chavez done. just then. Chavez buckled. Just to clarify, the rest of my prediction was that Chavez would turn it around in the second half of the fight. Hunting it out. By Taylor. Chavez continues to try to come back with the left of the body. Chavez landed a left. Taylor flurries furiously in return. Taylor has driven him off. That he doesn't want to pay the price. A right and a left by Chavez, and more blood comes out of Taylor's mouth. Taylor begins to flurry. Um, Crowd chanting Mexico, Mexico. Straight for Chavez. It's an unnecessary chance to get back into this. Look at the speed of Meldrick Taylor's flurry. If you've just joined us, you're in the middle of the ninth round of a classic performance by a young fighter on the threshold of greatness. I've seen more body shots thrown by Taylor than I have by Chavez. And the left hook to the body is supposed Triple to be Chavez's hook. great. Savage left hook to the body by Taylor. And another. Carried out George Benton's game plan to perfection. Whoa, beautiful combination. Brady punches inside. Brilliant stuff from Melvin Taylor. Chavez on the verge of going down. And Chavez, the great body puncher, is... Round 10 began with Taylor swarming Chavez with an incredible 20-punch combination to the head and body. Yet, it didn't seem to affect Chavez at all. The 11th round saw both fighters again engage in a savage display of infighting. Chavez was utilizing his hard chin as a major weapon. The 12th round was an all-out war, but it was Chavez whose punches had more power and snap left. Chavez landed several right-hand missiles, and with 24 seconds left, one of those rights badly hurt Taylor. A few seconds left, another right hand knocked Taylor down. Taylor got up, and after referee Richard Steele asked him if he was okay, Taylor didn't respond. Steele responded by stopping the fight with only two seconds left in the fight. Chavez won with one of the greatest come-from-behind victories in the history of the sport. Is in serious jeopardy. As round 11 comes toward a close, Julio Cesar Chavez must begin to contemplate in which to produce an unlikely knockout, or he will see his streak end before thousands of his countrymen. The impressive thing, he's still saying comments is thrown by Belgian Tiller. Here in the 11th round, incredible. Two hard punches at the... is a tired Meldrick Taylor slipping to the canvas. Another solid left hook from Meldrick Taylor.
Unbelievable! Richard Steele stopped the fight with fewer than five seconds to go. You're gonna watch Lou Duba go crazy now. You're gonna watch Lou Duba.